All right, well, welcome back. And I am very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Nadav Dim uh, from Duke University. And uh, he's gonna give the next talk on computational theory of graph sets and rigid sets. So let's give him a, a, a nice welcome. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so again, let me okay, thank David and thank everyone, all the organizers for organizing this and for inviting me. Um, so this is going to be, well, it's a little bit, the objects I'm going to talk about are discrete geometric, but there's going to be a lot less geometry really here. There's a more sort of analysis, optimization, and variance theory, but, you know, a nice refreshing difference, hopefully. Uh, so, um, and I'm going to start with a, a psychological experiment just to uh, sort of get us in the mood. It's not really extremely related to what we're going to be talking about, but a little bit. Okay, so this is a poll I did for my kids and my and their cousins. Um, so I showed them this shape, uh, you know, a rectangle, and I asked them which is more similar, this shape or this shape. Okay, so which of the two similar uh, shapes on the right of the line is more similar to the shape on the left? Okay, so here I ran a poll. Here you see an image of a photograph of one of my kids. It was very cute. I had a big shouting match with her today, uh, but. Uh, yeah, we're friends most of the time. Uh, so, okay, so these are the votes. So five of our my of, uh, the, my relatives, kids, uh, voted uh, for the shape on the right and three for the shape on the left. And one said neither. Um, okay, so now I, I do a, um, a poll within a poll. So I have a question to the audience to check your uh, psychologic, your opinions on children's psychology. What would you think is the difference or you know what characterizes kids that say this shape is more similar versus this shape? Any opinions from the crowd? You mean age or something like that? Or? Yeah, thanks. How are you? Uh, yeah, so age was the, the contributing factor, it seems. It's a very small sample set, but right. So it seems that children, uh, younger children, uh, vote more for the uh, for this shape, because and uh, older children give the sort of more sophisticated answer, so to speak, this shape. But then also, in a way, there's no real correct answer for this question. It's a little bit of an annoying question because um, you know it sort of depends like what what the rules are, right? Like what. Um, so for example, if these are buildings, so this, these two buildings are rather similar, just maybe this building has another little chimney on top, but if they're puzzle pieces, so these two pieces are, are identical, right? So it depends on the rules or in other ways and the kind of symmetry that data you wanna work with has, okay? So that's, okay, so this is sort of, again, it's not completely related to what I wanna talk about. What I really wanna talk about is data with symmetries. And specifically, I'm gonna be talking about graphs, sets, and rigid sets. Okay, where graphs and sets are the same graphs and sets we all know and love. Uh, and rigid sets are a little bit different. I'll explain exactly how I set these things as sort of objects with symmetries. In general, they're gonna be Euclidean objects with some symmetries. Okay, we'll get to that soon. Let's say a graph is a, you can think of it as an N by N matrix with uh, computation symmetries. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking about is the computational aspects of this. So while we can sort of, you know, so kids maybe age five and up, can understand this concept of you know different objects being the same because of a symmetry group in a way um it poses certain computational challenges because you know if you if the most basic thing we know how to do in computers are things like you know comparing euclidean vectors during their distance once you add a symmetry group in there things can get complicated okay and the picture i want to talk about really is how these rigid sets which again i'll define all these I'll explain exactly what I mean by all these things later, but how these rigid sets are sort of in the middle between graphs and sets. And I want to show two papers or two different projects where uh, we've used this in different ways, but sort of the same observation in two different, pretty different problems. Okay. Um, so these problems are the following. So they're sort of theoretical questions related to practical applications. Um, so the first question is related to pairwise alignment. Okay, so abstractly, let's say we have two objects, S1 and S2, um, and we have some this uh, symmetry group which acts on these object, objects. So the pairwise alignment problem will be to find um, 
a group operation that makes these two objects as similar as possible. In the sense, let's say that um, their uh, correlation is maximum. Okay, so I want to find the the rotation in this case that makes these two objects similar, right? But in general, whatever group transformation it is. Okay, so again, we will have three different objects. They'll have different group symmetries and different actions, and we want to solve this problem. Uh, you know, this exact same problem for different groups. And as it will turn out, this can make very big difference. So if I'm asking which of these problems is solvable in polynomial time, so although the structure is the same, different groups and different actions can give very different answers to that question. So that's the first thing I'm going to discuss. Um, the second thing I'll discuss uh, will be related to neural networks, which sort of um, uh, respect these symmetries. So they uh, compute uh, um, sort of features that are invariant to these symmetries. And I'm going to talk about a question of universality. So how we can make sure that we sort of, in a way, enumerate all possible invariants. But this, I'll go into it when we get there. Okay, so let's just start with the first part. Okay, so I'll start out with explaining about this uh, pairwise alignment problem. I'm first of all sort of fixing what, I, what exactly I mean by these three objects, sets, graphs, and rigid sets. And I, I didn't say before, but let me say now that I, if anyone is willing to ask a question um, while I'm talking, please do. Uh, or you can try in the chat, but I'm not sure I'll see it, but you can try. Um, okay, so set. So what do I mean by a set? So again, a set is a set, right? But I'm going to be talking specifically about a finite set with n elements. And these elements are all going to be vectors in some Euclidean space with the same dimension. Okay, so for example, this uh, space could be on R3. And that gives us one of the ways to um, represent uh, shapes, which are point clouds, right? So 3D shapes um, or 3D surfaces, right? We can represent in this way as just a collection of points in R3. And why do I want to think of them as sets? Because I don't really know how to organize these things, right? So I don't know which point should be first and which should be second. So I just want uh, to think of it as a set, which means that I want to be invariant to the way I, I order these points. Okay, um, and this basically happens not only in the geometric setting, uh, but also, you know, this kind of thing could happen in any, in many cases where we don't really know how to order objects. So for example, if, so this is my uh, personal, uh, the things I watch in Netflix. So imagine that each movie in Netflix has a big feature vector that describes it in some way. And you want to, let's say, comp compare Netflix users, um, then you don't, necessarily know how to order the movies. I mean, you could order them by date or something, but that, you know, when I watch them, but that's not necessarily the relevant parameter. So again, you want to sort of think of these things as sets. Okay, so uh, again, I want to think of, okay, so how do I think of sets using these symmetry ideas? So I think of a set of these sets as a matrix in Rd times n, or as n points in Rd. And I have this uh, symmetry to relabeling, right, which, uh, sort of in linear algebra language, I can write like this. So um, if I have this matrix X and I multiply it from the right by a permutation matrix, uh, then I wanna think of these two objects as the same. So this is like the symmetries I wanna be um, to take into account, okay? Now I come to the problem of aligning uh, sets, right? So that's our first topic, right? So we have our, our, our alignment problem where we find the best group symmetry. In our case, the grace, the symmetry group is our permutations, right? So we want to find uh, the best permutation, which makes these two objects as similar as possible to each other, right? Where as, again, each object is just n points in R3. And what this means practically is that, let's say you can imagine we have these two chairs and we, you know, they're represented as, let's say 10,000 points in R3, but we don't know they weren't when they weren't uh, ordered uh, consistently, right? So let's say, let's say the first point in this chair is over here in the front right leg, and the first point, in this uh, point cloud is on the front left leg. Okay. So what we want to do is find the permutation which um, aligns these things and sort of makes a consistent uh, labeling of both chairs, right? That's 
sort of the meaning of this problem. That's why we want to solve it. Okay, uh, so then I could ask the question, okay, here's an optimization problem. Do we know how to solve it? Okay, so just staring at, you might think maybe not because, you know, we have, we have to go over, you know, naively, we'd have to go over all permutations and find the best one. And we know that, uh, you know, so they are n factorial permutations. So it would be very expensive. We can't do it in polynomial time in n. Uh, but actually it turns out that this problem is solvable in polynomial time in n. Okay, and the easiest way to, there are several algorithms, but the easiest way to see this is that you can sort of phrase this thing as a linear program. So what do we mean by that? So uh, there's a sort of well-known uh, theorem called the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem that says that if you look at the bistochastic matrices, which is a nice set, the set of matrices whose rows and columns sum to one and whose entries are non-negative. So that's a nice convex set. We can describe it using uh, two n linear equalities and inequalities. Uh, okay, so you look at this set and the, and the extreme points, like the corner of these sets are exactly the permutation. As a result, when you look at this specific problem where you wanna solve uh, an optimization problem, which is linear in the matrices in P, uh, then you can solve this over this nice set, which we know how to work with, with linear programming. And the result is guaranteed to be on a corner. Okay, or there's, if there are set two permutations which are results or, or more, then there's a little bit of uh, issues with this because there are many solutions, but in general, that's what happens. Okay, so, um, and these issues are solvable in any case. So, okay, so this problem is, is solvable. Now I go to, uh, okay, my second type of data, which are graphs. So again, we know what graphs are, just to, uh, I'm gonna, when I say graphs, I'm gonna say, uh, you know, I have N vertices. I usually don't bother to even specify their names. Um, and I have some matrix A, which is usually a self adjoint uh, where, which sort of describes weights on the edges, not necessarily zero and one. Okay, um, and in any case, uh, so for graphs, the symmetries are permutations. Right, so um, what that means is if I have uh, my adjacency matrix uh, and you know the, the rows and columns of the adjacency matrix are just ordered according to the order I chose for the vertices, but the order for the vertices is usually not canonical and I can relabel the vertices and get something which is exactly the same graph, right? Um, okay, so these are our symmetries for that. And accordingly, um, when we talk about pairwise alignment for graphs, what we're gonna be talking about is this case where we have two different graphs, let's call them A and B, you know, focusing only on this matrix. And we wanna find a way to um, relabel B, let's say, relabel the vertices of B so that A or B are as similar as possible. This is called the quadratic assignment problem, right? So we have, again, the same problem as before, we are applying our transformation group and we're making A and B as similar as possible. It's a note, that uh, the transformation group is the same as before, the action is different. So instead of just multiplying from the right by permutation matrix, we now multiply, uh, we sort of uh, conjugate by the matrix, right? Um, and this problem, uh, right? So before we said it wasn't so hard actually. So this problem actually is, you can prove it's NP hard. Um, so this is a difficult problem, um, right? Now where one sort of, okay, so, a little bit of geometry. So uh, where do we uh, use this kind of thing? So one, um, one place where this has been used a lot is to sort of compute the gromer wasserstein distance between metric spaces. So let's say you have two um, uh, objects, right? Which uh, we have these two cats where one sort of is a um, isometric transformation of the other in the, um, you know, in the Riemannian sense. Uh, and so you can uh, try to find, so to find sort of like the correct correspondence between these cats would correspond to um, finding a, an isometry between them. So one way to do that is you sort of, uh, if these cats aren't a point cloud yet, you turn them into a point cloud. So you sample a certain number of points 
uh, you know, here I did uh, five coins, but usually you probably want to do a few hundreds or thousands, whatever your budget allows, right? And then you compute as A, you take the distance matrix. So you take, you know, for each pair of points, each point you think of as a vertex, for each pair you think of as an edge, you give it the edge, the weight of the distance. You do the same thing for the other uh, object that gives you other surface, that gives you your matrix B, and then you try to compare them, right? So the optimal permutation that sends A to B would correspond to some sort of uh, discrete isometric mapping or as isometric as possible mapping. Okay, so that's just sort of a, one type of application of this thing. There are many other applications which are maybe less geometric. Okay, and in any case, all, all we really wanna know for now is that this problem is NP hard. Okay, uh, and what I really wanna focus on is there are these rigid sets and there are sort of relationships with other uh, uh, to the previous two data types. Okay, so what are we doing in rigid sets? So uh, basically the set we're talking, the um, uh, set is a bad word. The, well, the, the domain we're working on is the same as with sets. Okay, so we have, we think, let's say of these chairs, which are, uh, we said before, they were a matrix in three by n, a three by n matrix, right? Or n points in R3. Um, and we now want to uh, notice, right, that this problem has more symmetries than we allowed before, um, because as generally, if we take a chair and we turn it around, so um, it's still the same chair, right? So we have uh, rotations, at least, uh, as additional symmetries. There are also translations. Uh, there could be also scaling. Uh, I'm maybe mainly going to be focusing about on permutations and rotations, translations and scaling. They're sort of easier ways to deal with. Sometimes I'll talk about translation too. But let's say you can, if you assume that your point cloud is is centered at zero, all your point clouds, then in a sense you sort of uh, canceled out the translation problem. Okay. <clears throat> so again, so this is all my uh, transformation group now. So it's a product of the um, rotations and permutations, right? Okay. Um, and okay, so also one remark is that sometimes, so the main application sort of in the geometric setting is when D equals three, little d, but there are also problems with D is larger than three. Uh, for example, uh, in the context of functional maps, which actually is a geometric thing uh, for translation tasks in NLP, all kinds of instances where you sort of embed your data into a high dimensional um, vector, uh, but you, you have this sort of rotational sym symmetry as well. Um, anyway, so, okay. So this is what we wanna talk about. Then we have, so we have this symmetry group. We stick it into our alignment problem, right? So we have um, our A and B, we wanna find in our group of transformation, the best group that makes B as correlated as possible with A. Okay, and again, what this means sort of practically is they have these two point clouds, these chairs, and I want to find, right, so I want to fix the labeling like I did in the first example, right, so I want uh, the point on the right, on the chair on the right to correspond to the sort of same point on the, for the chair on the left, but I also like to rotate uh, the chairs so that they'll be in the same orientation, right, so it's also an important problem, useful. Um, and what we want to ask is whether this problem is tractable, okay? And, okay, so if we just take a pause a second and think about it, right? So we have here something sort of a bit in the middle between um, the two things we had before, right? So if you, even if you, right, so um, if you replace this R with a P, then you get exactly this sort of uh, problem with graphs, right? Um, and it also picks up the dimensions here a little bit. Uh, if you just remove the R, then you get the problem with sets, right? So, so where does this sit exactly? Okay, so this is a sort of observation we made uh, in this paper. This wasn't the topic of the paper. I'm not sure how profound the observation is, but I think it's not used enough uh, by, I'm not sure. I, it's easy, not so difficult to understand, but I'm not sure people really uh, use it. Um, so, okay, so I, Look at rigid sets. There's a transformation I can make that turn them into graphs. Okay, so I have, uh, let's say, uh, this rigid set X, 
And as far as I'm concerned, if I apply a rotation and permutation to it, they're the same because this is a rigid set. If I do uh, this matrix multiplication, x transpose times x, then I'm going to get something uh, which is, you can think of it sort of as a replacement of a graph. Okay, it's going to be an n by n matrix where the rotation part canceled out. Okay, no matter how I rotate over here, once I do this transformation, I won't have a rotation anymore. So I'm only left with permutations, but on the other hand, the action of the permutation now will be more complicated. Okay, so it will be like the graph action. So what this sort of means is that if I want to work with rigid sets, I want to, let's say, tell if I have, I have two different rigid sets, I want to know if they're the same or not. I can reduce this, reduce, to the problem of comparing graphs. Now, that's not, that's sort of a reduction in the wrong direction, okay? So what I'm explaining now is that you can take this problem of rigid sets, which we don't know how difficult it is yet, and solve it using a problem we know is hard. Um, however, there's also a, uh, you can go the other way, okay? So if you take a Laplace of a graph, which is a positive semi-definite, you can always factorize it, and you're going to get something which has the structure of a rigid set. Okay, so you can, uh, you want to compare if two graphs are the same, and you take their Laplace and you factorize it, then you get two objects which you can uh, compare as rigid sets. Okay, um, so that sort of means, so this is a reduction in the correct direction. It means that. Um, that solving rigid sets should be difficult since otherwise we can solve for graphs using that, okay? However, uh, one important observation is that when you do this factorization, in, ge in general, the dimension of the, of the rigid set will be n, will be the number of points, right? So if you have an n by n matrix, you factorize it. In general, these will be full, full dimensional matrices, unless for some reason the Laplace is not full range, okay? So, Okay, so what this means again, uh, well, is that in terms of tractability, when we think of high dimensional problems, certainly if n equals b, uh, then we're not likely to be able to succeed to solve this rigid set problem. But we do have uh, something which is, um, and so in sort of in the theoretical computer science world, this is called fixed parameter tractable, which means that if I look, think of the dimension little b, Right as um, as a parameter. So if I fix it to three, which is a, you know one of the perhaps the most important applications, then possibly I will be able to fix, to solve this problem in polynomial time. If I take this uh, d to be large, then I'm going to encounter problems. Okay, so I can what this means. The fixed parameter tractable means that I can solve this in complexity which is a polynomial on n. And it will be probably exponential in this d, which if I fix to be three is not a problem. But if I let d run crazy, then this will be an issue. Okay. So specifically, how do I do that here? So again, it's not extremely sophisticated, I think. So you have your optimization problem, which we had before. I write it, I just do it by stages. Okay, so I can think of if I want to find the best rotation and permutation that bring A and B as close together as possible. I can do this in two, two steps. I can say for fix R, I can look for the best permutation possible, right? Now for fixed R, this problem we said before is computable in O to the N to the third. This is the problem of aligning sets. Um, and therefore, there's not such a big deal. Okay, and so in a sense, we have this function F of R, which means for fixed R, find the best permutation and tell me what the score of that is. And then we have a problem and if we can think of this as just an optimization problem of maxi maximizing f of r over SO3, okay? Now, this problem shouldn't be too difficult just because SO3 is, you know, it's not very high dimensional, right? So if it was SOD and D was very big, so, you know, the higher dimensional it is, possibly it could be a very hard problem, but for fixed, for low dimensional problems shouldn't be so difficult, okay? So that's, uh, sort of general philosophy. And what I want to talk about next is just how to do that, okay? So this is just really not related now to geometry almost at all. Uh, it's about continuous global optimization. So I have a fu function. I want to optimize, optimize it over SO3, okay? And even, I'm not going to be very, okay, to simplify things. We know that we can parameterize rotations in SO3 by three numbers, 
for example, it could be the um, Euler angles, or it could be, we usually use the, ex uh, sort of the exponent of skew symmetric matrices. Okay, so really you can think of this as just the question of how to optimize a function over a three-dimensional cube, okay? Um, and again, we're talking about global optimization. So I wanna really be guaranteed to find the global minimum, not use something like gradient descent or Newton's method, which could run into local minimum. Okay, um, so how do we do that? Um, so the simplest idea is sampling. Okay, so I can take my cube, I can sample it. Um, and sorry, wrong, press the wrong button. Okay, so I sampled my cube here for simplicity. I'm actually working with a square. Okay, just because it's hard to draw cubes. Um, okay, and uh, you can prove bounds on this. So it sort of is a function of the dimension. If the dimension is two or three and the accuracy, uh, and let's say your function is Lipschitz, you can say how well you're approximating the function using the sampling method. Um, okay, now this is not sort of the last word in the world of uh, global optimization. So people have thought of better ideas, probably also pretty well known. So one of them is branch and bound. Okay, so again, this is a, a pretty well known global optimization method in the context of um, specifically this problem of, of aligning shapes. These are sort of papers who did this in sort of computer vision type uh, world. Okay, so in branch and bound, uh, the idea is basically to do a course to fine approach where instead of uh, you know taking your cube or square and breaking it into evenly sized squares and evaluating in the middle of each square, uh, you're going to take start up with a pretty coarse partition, let's say to four big rectangles like this, big squares, and you evaluate only in the middle of those. And then you find some method to sort of try to figure out whether um, maybe you can throw these things out early on, okay? And we'll talk about that in the next slide, how we do that, right? And then possibly, let's say, we could figure out already just from this first step that these two squares on top um, don't contain a minimizer. So we're gonna go to the next level, okay? So we only looked at the squares where we still possibly uh, could have a minimizer. We uh, subdivide these into four squares each, right? And then we evaluate in the middle of these squares. <clears throat> Possibly we'd be able to rule out, let's say these two squares and these two squares, and we'd be left only with these, and then we subdivide them again, et cetera. Okay, and in general, if we have a, a good way to, to throw out squares, which is guaranteed to throw out squares only when it's really legitimate, then we should be able to come up with a better method, which evaluates the function less times and it's cheaper. Okay, so that's what branch and bound does. Specifically, how do we eliminate things? So um, the way this works is, okay, imagine we have our square here. We have a, a point in the center of the square, which we call x zero, and we have the diameter of the square or the radius of the square, let's call it, uh, delta, which is like the, the biggest possible distance of any point in the square from x zero, right? And then we want to be able to uh, figure out possibly uh, that this square doesn't contain a minimizer and we don't have to search in it anymore just from evaluating the single point. So how we do that, we evaluate the function at the point. We, let's say we have some method of computing elliptic bound, L, okay? Uh, this actually is something that has to do with the geometry. Uh, you know, if you have to, given your function F, which in our case is geometric, uh, then you have to be able to somehow uh, figure out what the Lipschitz bound is, but let's forget about that for now. Um, <clears throat> and then using your, your evaluation in the center of the square and your Lipschitz bound, you're able to know that the fun and nowhere in the square will the function be lower than this value, right? The value of the function at f minus the Lipschitz bound times the radius of the square, right? Because uh, this just follows from the Lipschitzness of this thing, okay? As a result, uh, if I have, okay, so this is not the first evaluation I did. I have all kinds of other evaluations I had already. If I can show that this lower bound is larger than the function, uh, larger than the best evaluation I found so far, so this basically proves that there is no lower bound, no uh, minimum inside this square. Okay, so I can just throw out this square and continue on. So that's the way uh, sort of lift its branch and bound works. Okay. 
Um, and what I really want to talk about naturally is what uh, we did. So this is work with uh, Shahar Kovaski, which also at the time was a postdoc with me at Duke. Um, and what we suggested is a, this idea we called quasi Brownian bound. Okay, so it's not exactly the same as this Brownian bound thing. It's similar, very much similar in structure, but it's some trick which allows you to replace these lower bounds with something we call quasi lower bound, where you uh, Okay, so you replace this thing, which is uh, linear in the diameter radius, I call this, right? The radius of the square, with something which is uh, quadratic in the radius of the square, okay? With some other bound, which is now Lipschitz bound, but something which is more related to like the second order variation of the function, okay? And you can do this, and this works similarly. So what I mean by that is, if the other method, the branch and bound method is guaranteed to uh, find a global minimum up to an error of uh, epsilon. Uh, so this will work in the same way. Uh, okay. But uh, this is a quasi, this is despite the fact that this is a quasi lower bound, meaning, okay, so if I allow, uh, what I mean by a quasi lower bound is as follows, it's illustrated in this picture. In this picture, we now have a 1D function and uh, cubes, which we reduced to squares for visualization, now turned into intervals, right? Um, and a lower bound in this picture would be a line, like the lines in blue here, which are strictly under the function, right? Or maybe they could touch the graph of the function, but they have to be uh, under it. Uh, that would be the definition of a lower bound, right? Uh, when a, a quasi lower bound, uh, we define it to be a, as follows, as something which is allowed to be, not really be a lower bound, in general. So for example, you can see in this interval or in this interval that these lines actually intersect the function. They are they are not, okay, so the, I, for this interval, I, I assign a, a number, which is visualized by this line, which actually could be higher than the value of the function at that point. Um, but uh, what I want, what I require from the quasi lower bounds is that they will be real lower bounds at intervals which contain a minimizer, okay? so. For example, in this interval here, I have a minimizer and I have a quasi lower bound. I have, I mean, my quasi lower bound is a real lower bound, okay? So that's sort of the definition of a quasi lower bound. Why does this help us? Uh, so this helps us because, okay, even though we don't know where the minimizer is, we do know that at the minimum, uh, if this function is differentiable, uh, let's say twice differentiable, then it's first, the derivative is gonna be zero. Right, and therefore, at the minimum, uh, we can have this kind of quadratic bound, right? Sort of depending on, let's say, the you know the maximum of the norm of the Hessian in my my whole uh, space, compact space, right? So, um, right. So that's sort of basically the trick. So I can I can find this kind of bound. I can say that this bound will be true in intervals that contain the minimums, despite the, fa despite the fact that I don't really know which intervals these are, I'm just applied the same bound everywhere. And it's only true for intervals which contain a minimizer. And when you think of it, that's not an issue because really what, what we use the lower bounds for in this whole original algorithm was just to find intervals which contain a minimizer uh, or guarantee that they don't, right? So then you have a sort of, you can, there are sort of two options. If I'm sitting in a specific interval or box or cube, if it contains a minimizer, then my bound is, is good and I'm okay. If it doesn't contain a minimizer, then I am already okay. So it doesn't matter if I throw it out, even though my bound is not a lower bound. So that's sort of the general idea, the trick. Um, and uh, what can you say about these tricks in general? Okay, so I think, Okay, so we had three algorithms, right? We have our sampling algorithm, we have branch and bound, we have this new idea quasi branch and bound. Um, and so I would sort of argue that uh, the sampling is not as good as the branch and bound, the branch and bound is not as good as the quasi branch and bound. How to formulate this is through the following theorem, which says that um, the number of samples you need to minimize a function on a, a cube dimension D, okay? Um, to epsilon accuracy uh, is bounded uh, above and below by constants, which uh, in the sampling case, right, this is the easiest case to uh, sort of theoretically evaluate. Uh, we know that 
Uh, it would take one over epsilon to the power of d samples to get epsilon accuracy. Uh, for branch and bound, you can actually really show that um, this is better. Okay, so I, as so, I, this is this analysis is assuming that d is fixed, your function is fixed, uh, and your epsilon you're taking your epsilon to zero, so you can show that. Uh, actually, the rate of the branch and bound goes to like one over epsilon to the power of d over two. And what's sort of uh, surprising, uh, pleasantly surprising about this quasi branch and bound is that its convergence rate actually is uh, logarithmic in one over epsilon. So there's a sort of why is it surprising? Because I would sort of, you know, initially really when we were working this, I'd expected this would be like one over epsilon to the power of d over four, maybe, or something like that. But there's actually a sort of a, a jump there. Um, and this is, I'll talk about that for a sec, but this is, this is what it looks like. So here we have alignment problems for d equals two and d equals three, which is what we're focusing on in this talk. And a comparison of branch and down versus quadrant branch and down algorithm. Okay, so branch and down here is pink, quasi branch and down is blue. Um, and this is a graph of the number of evaluation in logarithmic scale versus tree depth. So that means like, the size of the cube in the search tree. So they go smaller and smaller. Uh, and sort of the meaning of what happens in branch and bound is that uh, as you ask for higher and higher accuracy, uh, the number of evaluations you need really grows uh, quite a lot. So you can see that here. For quasi branch and bound, you sort of stabilize at a fixed rate. So the number of when you go smaller and smaller and you're asking for more and more accuracy, it ju just increases the cost by sort of constant amount. Okay, so why is this? Um, so the reason is sort of, this is called a clustering phenomenon in sort of the general branch and bound literature. The reason is that, uh, again, because your function uh, changes quadratically uh, near minimum, what happens as you, uh, if you, if your bound is linear in the diameter, well, really your, fun your function is really changing much smaller than that. So, so the cubes near a minimum usually are very, very difficult to discard using a linear algorithm, like algorithms with linear, um, which are linear in the diameter of the cube. But uh, if you have an, an algorithm which changes as quadratic in the diameter of the cube, uh, then your situation is much better because you you're really in the right rate. And so sort of you're sort of uh, in the right rate up to probably a constant, which you're missing a multiplicative constant. Okay, so that uh, is more or less that. Um, a few remarks to conclude. So here's one thing that but I, I generally feel that uh, this is really a great method for global optimization of this problem. Uh, the real challenge is versus local optimization methods. Okay, so, uh, right, so we, and when we teach uh, numerical analysis or optimization, whatever, usually you learn about the Newton method and, and, uh, and the gradient descent, like we discussed before, you don't really learn about branch and bound as much, right? Why is that? Because these methods are slow. They explode with the dimension. Even when the dimension is small, they're still more expensive, okay? So on the other hand, so when the dimension is three, hopefully you know it's fair enough to use them. So that those are the real this is the real competition. So here's a sort of argument to for my best argument for why uh, this is worthwhile. So of course you'd like to use a global optimization method because it gives you the global minimum. So you'd actually like to have uh, some example where you can show that this is doing better than local optimization algorithms. So here this is uh, some application we have in Duke where we have uh, many uh, sort of um, uh, many uh, morphological objects, let's call them. Like, uh, so these are teeth of lemurs. We also have other bones of other primates and other animals. And we're trying to work on automatic ways to uh, compare these objects and sort of, you know, ultimately deduce sort of a, a, a remark, um, conclusions about uh, the evolution of these species and, and things like that. Okay, so, but the first step is to be able to align these things. Okay, so here, this is the method, which is sort of the standard method, which we usually use. Um, and you can see that, so specifically, this is a, you know, these are like 10 teeth from 10 different lemurs, which are very similar to the same genus, the same uh, sort of biological species, uh, but they're different lemurs. Um, and uh, you see that uh, these 
teeth were not aligned correctly in many examples. This is like sort of their notoriously difficult example. Um, and to do this, they, they're basically solving the same energy that I, we were talking about now, but they're doing it, uh, the same function, but using some local optimization method. So it turns out that with my method, you know, the method I told you about now, we can do this, you know, accurately, but again, there's this uh, time issue. Okay, so this takes us two minutes versus two seconds. Um, and no one likes that. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's the big disadvantage. Okay, um, and this is sort of related to the fact that the complexity of, of this method is all of n to the third times log one over epsilon, or in other words, um, the function, if you remember the definition of the function we started with, um, right, we had, a, it's a function of rotation and for each rotation, we have to find the best permutation. Finding the best permutation, is, you can solve it in polynomial time, but it's still a relatively expensive function. It takes n to the third to solve. So that's what sort of makes this, you know, that, that's why this really takes two minutes, even though it's, it's relatively low dimension and we have this nice trick to get this log one over epsilon, but that's the main issue. Um, and uh, one thing for my lawyers, so to speak, uh, is that there is a, also a paper um, which I wrote about a smooth quasi branch unbound. And I don't want to talk about this paper at all, but I just want to mention that there are various issues of like, so when you do, when you're really talking about smooth functions, uh, then uh, there are other things you can do with branch and bound, which also have this log one over epsilon uh, 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 property. But then with the quasi branch and bound, you can do better things. And actually with this function I told you about before, you can do both the Lipschitz trick and our trick, even though it isn't smooth. So there are various sort of issues which I, I swept under the rug, but uh, there's somewhere out there. Um, so anyway, uh, so that was uh, the end of the first topic. I'd be happy for questions. Let me just uh, um, sort of summarize this in a way that will be helpful for uh, later on. Okay, so what really, so the bottom line for the next uh, step is, we sort of, we visited sets. We saw that aligning sets is practical in order of n to the third. Aligning graphs is NP-hard. Um, working with 3D rigid sets is tractable. Uh, but the way to do this is to sort of brute force the part which is related to the 3D part, and then solve, use the fact that you can solve this for sets, right? So that was a sort of the, the method we use, and that's what's going to be repeating itself in the next uh, part. And then, in, in a sense, what I focused on is, is how exactly to brute force uh, on, the, on the low dimensional component using either sampling or branch and bound, quasi branch and bound. So that was sort of the main topic here, but that's not going to continue with us. It's the next step. So maybe, so let me have a drink and if, are there any questions up to now? I, I had a quick question. Um, I don't know if it's quick, but uh, uh, so I, I, did you need to have a Lipschitz bound to run the, to, to run your global optimization algorithm or, uh, or or approximation of that? Like, what do you actually need to run? Well, I have two question, answers for that. Uh, yes and no. Uh, so <laughs> I'll start with yes. So we need not a Lipschitz bound, but a, a bound, which is, again, if, if, if this function was smooth, so you need like a bound, let's say, on the, on the norm of the Hessian. Okay, because again, this is sort of based on saying, okay, at the minimum, the gradient actually vanishes, but uh, the Hessian, um, the norm of the Hessian, but you know, so you just have to bound the Hessian. So that's the yes answer. Uh, the no answer is that again. So if I'm if I'm now playing uh, in the in the ground in the ground of like you know the general smooth optimization problem, then you have many things to do. For example, right, you can take like the Taylor expansion up to second order, and use that for bounds and stuff like that. And those methods. Uh, would sort of work comparably well. Again, so then, you know, this whole paper is about trying to find, you know, a way to, that actually this quasi branch and bound is helpful in a way. But so, for example, if you do the Taylor expansion, uh, a second order Taylor expansion, you actually really need to know the real gradient, right? Um, now, the two algorithms I told you about, the Lipschitz and, uh, and the quasi branch and bound, you only need to have a number which is a bound. And you sort of know that if this number is big enough, you'll be okay. So, 
In that sense, you can run these algorithms when you don't know the bound. They're just, you know, they're guaranteed to work with the large enough bound. And that, I think, you know, that might actually end up being more useful than any of the other things that I talked about. So just the fact that you can, you can maybe, you know, plug in a guess a bound and say, you know, you know, I don't think my function is changing more fast than, you know, 1,000, whatever, what that means even, uh, you know. So for Lipschitz bound, you know, I don't think my Lipschitz bound is larger than 1,000, even if you don't have the power or the ability to compute what the real Lipschitz bound is, just guess. Um, so I think that's something, you know, that people have, have discussed doing. I didn't make it up, and I think it, that could be better, uh, a better application. Okay. Thanks. I think Nina has a question, too. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm wondering, is, is this specific? Is this specific to rotation or it's it's applicable to a larger but still small dimensional set of transformations? Right, uh, it's applicable, right. In general, the, the method is applicable for, you know, just optimizing any function, but it should be low dimensional if you want it to end in a reasonable time. So yes, right. Uh, and there is, I mean, so if you're not going with, what, you know, my second answer to David, you want to actually compute the bound so for your function. So that's sort of application dependent. So if you have now some other low dimensional group you want to bound, so then you're actually going to have to, you know, do the math uh, by yourself. Uh, or, you know, whoever is doing this will have to, you know, write, do the math and compute the bound. So in our paper, we computed the bound for rotations. That specific bound is, is only for that function. But the idea is, um, thank you. Anything else? So I, I have, Two small question. The, the first one I think is tricky. How do you expand that when the cardinality of the sets are not equal? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so again, I think it's sort of related also to what Nina said. So you, you'd have to sort of not do this with permutations, but you can, you can do a, you know, a related problem where you solve with sort of discrete correspondences, which are not permutations, or maybe like one-sided permutations. So you can do that. But uh, we have something like with closest point, which is not uh, in the paper. We have another ver version with closest point, which doesn't need permutations. It doesn't need the, the number of points to be the same. And my, my, my second question is probably related. In the set case, when you're really looking for permutation, not the quadratic case, Mm -hmm. You can relax the problem, a la Kantorovich, and you still guarantee that you're going to find uh, the right mm -hmm. permutation. The advantage with relaxing the problem is that your function f now, you can analytically compute its uh, derivative and Hessian with respect to the rotation. Okay. So, would the, have you ever thought of comparing that with your quasi branch and bound? I think we, we sort of do that in a way. Like the way we compute the bound, I think is like that. I'm not sure, I'd have to uh -huh. check. Anyway, I- Because they, one of the key elements of the success of your method is that Lipschitz bound. Because if it's really too large, you're going to spend a lot of time uh, finding what the right direction is. However, if you can uh, estimate that Lipschitz bound from the behavior, local behavior of the Hessian, then you yeah. might have uh, some information there that can be useful. That's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, let's so let me continue because I I, I miscalculated my time, so I should continue. <laughs> okay, so now I have like ten minutes, right, David? Uh, uh, yeah, that's about right. 10, 11, 12 minutes. <laughs> okay, so let me. Okay, well, we'll we'll do what we can. Okay, so maybe. Okay, so I have a bit of too much preliminaries here, but um, so maybe I'll skip some of them. Okay, so um, right. Um, so what I want to talk about the second topic is about invariant networks. So in invariant networks, um, right, a sort of general paradigm where we want to find solve some uh, problem we call supervised learning learning problem, which I assume many people are familiar. But we have like a function we want to learn, for example, this function whose input is an image, its output is a cat. You say like, you know, this image is a cat or a dog, or you have some finite set of possibilities. 
Um, right, so this is the fun problem you want to solve. Um, and the way you want to solve, so you want to sort of learn this function and you learn this function by defining some cla parametric class of functions which you want to solve the problem from. Um, and uh, then uh, choosing the best one that you can based on the data, right? So you have, let's say a finite number of images which someone told you if it's a cut or down and you want to solve the optimization problem in this way, okay? Um, now in varying networks, so this is, let's say, let's call this, uh, this is supervised learning, let's call, you know, this class of functions, let's call them neural networks. Um, and forget about the fact that sometimes they're not called neural networks. Um, now, uh, invariant networks as an idea of sort of trying to choose uh, the function class so that it respects the invariance, variances of the problem in hand. So for example, in images, you have translation invariance. If you take it as cat, you put it somewhere else in the image, it's still a cat, right? So you want your uh, um, parametric functions to sort of um, respect that, right? Uh, so that's what happens in, okay, so for images, really people use convolutional neural networks, which are in a sense invariant to this translation transformation. And this is like, you know, the, the thing people use. So therefore, based on, based on that, there are various attempts to look at other data and figure out what those, what the symmetries of that data is and uh, work with that to um, you know, you know, and build functions which are respect these invariances. So again, if we're talking about sets and graphs and rigid sets, so there are various uh, uh, suggestions in the literature for all three of these things, okay? So you know, people write articles about these things, but here we're in math, we're not interested in doing anything, we just wanna prove things, right? So uh, what we're, uh, one interesting question uh, which people ask is whether these constructions are universal. So what that means is, okay, you're building a set of invariants, which are invariant functions, and you want to find the best one, but is this set written, rich enough? Okay, so this is called uh, universality. And we're all sort of neural networks, which I decided not to define it then, can approximate any continuous function. You can then ask what happens um, for invariant functions, right? So uh, Okay, so I have my invariant functions. I have my invariant network, which is, you know, it contains only invariant functions, but is there a gap? Or can my invariant networks, this sort of family of invariant functions I define, can it construct any invariant function? Okay, so that's my second question. Um, and again, so we have these sets, graphs, and rigid sets. For sets, it's relatively easy to prove that whatever construction people use, which I didn't de describe, uh, is universal. So if you you have a parametric family of functions and you uh, you can approximate any function with this parametric family. For graphs, uh, in general, the answer is no. Uh, and for rigid sets, uh, this is sort of what I want to talk about. Okay, so we have a recent paper on that, which shows that you can using uh, networks called tensor field networks for rigid sets, we can prove that you can approximate any. A, a function which is invariant to rotations and permutations. Um, okay, and one sort of remark, it's a little bit of sort of soft remark, is that when I say that you can or can't do this, I sort of mean with linear complexity and n. So I feel we have to define these notions a little bit better in general, but sort of um, you can build some family of functions and graphs which can approximate any function on graphs, but uh, th and there are papers that do that, but these constructions are very far from what people do in practice. So what you really want to have is you have a family of functions, uh, which sort of depends on hyperparameters, uh, um, and the size. So the size of this family should depend linear in n. You can also make this family bigger using some other parameters which are free. When you take those parameters, this hyperparameter to infinity, you can approximate any invariant function. That's sort of what you want to do. Uh, a less mathematical, uh, but more precise statement is you want to be able to prove that networks that people use can approximate any function um, and not just invent your own network, okay? So that's sort of what we're trying to do. Um, okay, what I want to talk about, I might steal a little bit, okay, is, um, okay, so again, so our result is saying we have this network, tensor field network, that eats, you know, the input to the network is, uh, uh, a chair or some three by n object. And 
the functions that it, it proposes as a candidate, so the set of functions that it, you're willing to work with are all invariant to rotation, permutations, and translations. Okay. Um, and we can show that this uh, set of functions that they provide um, is, um, it contains all continuous functions which are invariant. So really what I wanna talk about now for a few minutes is just, I don't wanna introduce what this network even is. I just wanna talk about in general, how to efficiently compute all continuous functions which are invariant to translations, permutations and rotations. And even what do these functions look like? Okay, so I'm giving you a point cloud I'm asking you, uh, you know, give me a description sort of of all the functions which are invariant to these relevant transformations. What does that look like? Okay. Um, so how do we do this? So uh, the methodology, first of all, is working through polynomials. So you can actually prove that uh, the G, so let's call our group G of rotations, permutations, and translations, uh, G invariant functions, continuous functions are uh, approximate. Um, the, the G invariant polynomials are dense in the continuous G invariant function, okay? So you can think of this as just a question of uh, how do we uh, construct all G invariant polynomials, okay? And what we sort of show is that there's a way to compute these polynomials with complexity, which is linear in N, but grows rather fast with the sort of the degree of the polynomials, okay? So, uh, polynomial of degree six would have complexity more or less of three to the six times to compute that, okay? Um, and again, okay, so a short remark is that, uh, you know, if instead of three, you put, uh, you know, your point cloud is of dimension little d, of some double little d, so you see that this becomes worse, right? If little d is sort of equal to n, then your complexity is not linear in n anymore. So this is sort of related to what we were talking about before. Um, I have a more precise slide about that, but I'll skip it. Okay, so that's what I want to show you, really. So, like, how do I do something? How do I compute compute these kind of polynomials efficiently? So, let's start with a simple example. Let's think of all the polynomials on uh, X, right? So, this is my point cloud in three by n of degree two, which are invariant to rotations and permutations. Okay. So, what do those look like? So, they're actually it's a linear space spanned by two polynomials. This is the first one. Uh, the sum of uh, the norm of all the points squared. Okay, so this is invariant to rotations because of this norm, it's invariant to permutations because you sum over all indices. And here's another one, you sum over all inner products. Okay. And now, uh, okay, and this is sort of a way to write them in matrix form through this X transpose X, which is an N by N matrix. Um, okay, so now what I wanna ask you, uh, whether you can compute these functions with linear complexity in N. Okay, uh, so the answer is yes. This may be easier maybe to see for the first polynomial because you just compute the norm squared, right? Of points in R3 and then you sum it. So it's N operation. Here, this is also true, even though you know, it would seem like the natural way to do this is to compute all N squared inner products and sum them up. But actually, um, you can do this differently. Okay, so the way I'd like to say this is you can, sort of do both of these, uh, compute both of these polynomials using something I would call moment. Okay, so the first polynomial, uh, you can rewrite as the trace of either X transpose X or X, X transpose, so those two things are equal. X, X transpose is a three by three matrix. It's sort of the second order moment of the point cloud, okay? Where a moment is like summing over all the points of a certain polynomial or a certain polynomial, right? So this is a three by three matrix. Um, and this, which is, again, this is like the sum of all inner products, you can rewrite this as, uh, let's jump a few things here, is sort of the outer product of the first order moment uh, matrix. Okay, so if you look at this, instead of doing X, if you uh, multiply X by one N, that sort of gives you the first order moments of your point cloud. And you do the same thing here, and then you take their outer product, okay? Or another way to write this is the trace of the, uh, excuse me, this is the inner product, but this is, you can write this as the trace of the outer product of the first order moment matrix. Okay. So uh, these are the two uh, polynomials. Again, so because computing moments uh, in R three times N will have complexity, which is uh, linear in N, uh, doing this in this way uh, will be linear in N, the computation. Computational price of that will be linear in N. 
Okay, and to generalize this, uh, one useful observation is you can sort of think, why is this thing invariant to both rotations and permutations? How does this work? Okay, so let's say I take my X. This is my function, trace of M2 of X, the second order moment matrix of X. Um, now I'm gonna plug in a rotation and a permutation. Okay, so I, I rotate and permute my point cloud. What happens to my function? Okay, so when I compute the second order moments, uh, so moments are permutation invariant, the permutation just disappears, but I, it ends up, it turns out that what I do is I sort of conjugate the rotational part, okay? So, and then in the second step, uh, I'm now gonna compute the trace and the trace is invariant to this conjugation operation, right? That's why I get exactly the same thing as I started from F when I had just X without rotating and permuting, okay? So this thing is generalizable. So if you look at um, the D, like a D-dimensional tensor, tensor of all moments in, of X, so that there would be like three to the D such tensors. Um, then uh, when you rotate and three to the entries to that tensor, then if you rotate and permute the point cloud, that would correspond to computing uh, the moments of the original point cloud and applying some linear transformation, which is not conjugation by R, but uh, something called the uh, D-dimensional chronicle product of R, okay? When capital D equals two, these two things are the same. Um, okay, and that's sort of, uh, so that's what happens when you compute moments. So when you compute D-dimensional moments, the permutations pull out, the rotations act in a sort of predictable way. Uh, and this is computable in Edo then to the third. And so if I have a general uh, pro polynomial which is invariant to both rotations and permutations, so for example, something like this, right? This is a four a degree four uh, polynomial in my point cloud. Um, then I can have I can write my homogeneous polynomial of degree D in this form, where uh, uh, outside I have a linear operation which behaves sort of like trace. Okay, so trace is, the, is what we have when capital D equals two. In general, we have some sort of linear invariant operation, which is invariant to this rotation action, um, the D-dimensional chronicle product of matrices. Um, and on the right-hand side, I have either, this could be like the D-dimensional moment tensors. It could also be, let's say like before we had the, the outer product, of uh, the first dimension times the first dimension. So any outer product of uh, tensors with sum to D, these indices sum to D would work in the same way. So in any case, so again, so the idea was that we have uh, con all continuous invariant functions. We can approximate them by uh, polynomial invariant functions. And then these we can sort of trans way to compute them in a way which is only linear in N though it's sort of grows rather fast in the degree, okay? And the last thing I wanna uh, talk about, uh, let's skip this for a second, or almost last thing, is how we, okay, so, sorry. Okay, so if we look at the, our conditions here, right? Um, so um, this can, um, okay, so we want to be able to uh, compute these things, okay? So we can show, let's say, if we have a family of functions, whatever it is that can compute these functions and compute all linear invariant functions in this sense, then we're in business, okay? Uh, so these functions, they just have a specific formula. So it's not surprising to show that, you know, these things exist, but how, how do we know that we know how to characterize all of these things, right? So when D equals two, we saw one example, the tricks, but in general, how do you characterize all possible things? So that sort of comes from uh, uh, some fancy, well, not that fancy actually, representation theory, which sort of says, okay, so uh, if we have my representation of, uh, we have a linear action of SO3, um, R3 to the D, which is this tensor product. And I wanna know what all linear invariant functions are from here to the reals. Um, then there is a sort of canonical decomposition of any representation, so any linear action on uh, a vector space into a direct sum of something called irreducible representations. Never mind what that is. Uh, I mean, probably many people know, but if you don't, so never mind. And for these irreducible representations, there's some tool called Schur's lemma, which says, which gives you these uh, linear uh, mappings in a very simple way. So. It basically says that uh, linear 
invariant maps between irreducible representations are just are trivial, just like multiplications of identities. Um, okay, so that's that. And then, uh, so thanks for your patience, David. Two more minutes, okay? Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, okay. So then the second part of the paper I'm not gonna tell you about is uh, actually showing that uh, tensor field networks, so a specific architecture, a specific family of functions can uh, build the polynomials as we discussed, okay? So there is, uh, you know, given a, you wanna, let's say, build all polynomials of degree D. So if you take the tensor field network uh, with a certain budget, you can do that. Um, and skipping, skipping, skipping. <laughs> yeah, we have some experiments. Um, right? We have our bottom line, uh, which is that um, we can do parallelized alignments of rigid sets and then to the third log one over epsilon, and that we can sort of characterize all invariant functions on these rigid sets. Okay. Um, open question, skipping, skipping. Shameless advertising is important. So I'm starting a, a position in the math uh, technion, math department in Technion next year. It's in Israel and I need students. So if there's anyone, if you know of anyone who's interested, uh, please send them to me. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. Sure. Very interesting talk. Um, I, uh, yeah, do we have any questions for Dr. Tim? So I, I, I don't know if this is a short question, but uh, I'd be interested to know a little more about how the tensor networks approximate uh, the, these polynomials. So I, I mean, are they, are they actually invariant or are they approximating the invariants? They are invariant. Um, they're, they're a family of functions which are always invariant by construction. Uh, and then the question is, what, how do they approximate? Um, so what do you mean by how do they approximate? Like, Well, so you showed that, the, that these invariant polynomials approximate. Right. Well, you didn't show that, but that, that's sort of the assumption. That sort of makes sense because we know, I feel, you know, as a mathematician, I feel pretty good with polynomial approximation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then yeah. you're, you're going to replace this with a neural network uh, family of functions, some sort of mm -hmm. set of those functions that are invariant. So is that, is that what the argument is? You have a different set of invariant functions and you can show, you can approximate these polynomials to yeah. arbitrary degree and then the polynomials approximate and everything all over the map is, is invariant. Is that sort of the argument? Exactly right. Okay. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Um, are there any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank uh, Dr. Jim again. Thank you. And, uh, oh, there is a, well, I'll, I'll save your question just for a second. Uh, sure. Steve. Um, we can talk after. Um, I'm going to just stop the recording. Uh, we do.